determine convergence divergence. So this geometric series is one of the only series that we actually can find the value of the sum. After this, we'll just determine does it converge, does it not converge. When, if you do need to add up an infinite series, and what you can generally do is just add up the first few thousand terms and you'll get really close to the actual number. No, you don't do that by hand. <laughs> you can do that uh, programming languages, Microsoft Excel, there's a lot of ways you could add thousand numbers together faster than, uh, you know, once you put it in there. If you've done any computer programming, you know it happens really quickly, way less than a second. You can add up these numbers. Uh, so if you do need to do an infinite series and get an approximation, you can use a computer to do it super fast. And there are libraries out there, math libraries, that will add up the first uh, million, two million, ten million terms relatively quickly as well. So there are lots of ways to get really good estimates for these sums. Uh, unfortunately, by hand, the only ones you can really do, if you get lucky, you can do a telescoping series that we saw where terms cancel, and the other type is if they're geometric. You could compute them by hand and get the exact number they would converge to. So here's our last example. Find the exact sum. Summation k equals 1 to infinity, 3 to the k minus 1 minus 1 divided by 6 to the k. So first thing you notice, that does not look like a geometric series. So let's make it a geometric series. What are some, what's some algebra that I can do? So here is geometric series. Your brain should be thinking k equals 0 to infinity r to the k equals 1 over 1 minus r when r absolute value less than 1. So that should be the thought in your brain right there. How can I make this look geometric? So what are some ideas? Um, well, remember, if we multiply by anything, we've got to multiply by 1, or else we'll change the sum. So I could multiply by something, but it better be a fraction that's numerator, denominator, the same. What other algebra move can I do? Break it into five fractions. So we can break this into two fractions. So I'll just split it up over our denominator 6 to the k. So we have 3 to the k minus 1 over 6 to the k minus 1 over 6 to the k. So that was a pretty easy algebra move to make. When am I allowed to write it as, so I'll write this down, but then I want to write down when it's actually true. So this may equal, k equals 1 to infinity, 3 to the k minus 1 over 6 to the k minus summation 1 over 6 to the k. When would these be equal? Or maybe when would they not be equal? We had a property up above. Yeah, if they're convergent, I can reorder. So this is actually a reordering. So what does that mean? If we look on the left side here, so this original one, the first term would be uh, 3 to the 0. So this first term would be the difference right here. If you look over here, the first term, I would do all of these ones on the left, add them all together, and then I would add up all the ones on the right, and then subtract those two numbers. So this is a reordering right here. So reordering is dangerous. When are we allowed to reorder all the terms in a series? If it converges. So if you're sure everything is going to converge, all these sums are actual numbers, you're allowed to reorder them like this. 
So I can reorder as long as they converge. So let's think about, do these converge right here? So separately, they have to converge. Let's look at the less complicated one first. 1 over 6 to the k. What type of series is that? That is geometric. What is R? 1, 6. So I can write it. 1 over 6 to the k is 1, 6 to the k power. So this one's definitely going to converge. What about the first one? 3 to the k minus 1 over 6 to the k. So we're going to do a little work on this. So let's rewrite it. Let's shift k down to 0. So I'm going to drop the k value from 1 down to 0. So try your best to rewrite what actual powers of 3 and 6 you should have here. So I drop k by 1, so I have to compensate. So figure out what powers should be here. So we drop the k by one, so we have to un we have to compensate and increase it by one. You can always plug in your first value, which in this case is zero. We get three to the zero over six to the one, which is exactly what we get on our first term original. So this is the first one is pretty close to being set up for a perfect uh, geometric series. The problem with the second one is we're starting at one, not zero. So let's go ahead and fix that problem. So I'm going to start at 0. And I dropped k by 1, so I have to compensate by adding 1. So we're getting pretty close to being geometric series. So take a minute right now and see if you can figure out the two, what value each of these series is going to converge to. And here's the, the first step, if you're struggling to see the first step on um, the first series. 6 to the k is 6 times 6 to the k. No, 6 to the k plus 1 is 6 to the first times 6 to the k. So I just broke a 6 out of the, one of the 6's out of that multiplication.
questions? So I skipped an algebra or an arithmetic step or two here. I try to show almost every algebra step that I took, though. So here was a complicated geometric series. It was really two geometric series subtracted, but they both converged, so I was allowed to break them apart. If one of them, or if either of them or both were not convergent, then this would just be not convergent overall. So some of your homework should be geometric. Get an exact number on their uh, convergence or divergence. And some of them will just be, hey, does this converge or does it diverge? So we're going to take a trip back to integrals and finish off chapter 8. So 8.7 is improper integrals. So what are improper integrals? There is two types of improper integrals. And one type is you're basically integrating across infinity. And there's two ways to do it. I don't know which one your book calls type 1 and type 2. So I'll just go type 1 is the first one I'm thinking of. So type 1 is where it looks like integral from a to infinity. So instead of a to a number, this is a all the way. <coughs> so you keep going. fx dx. And the way we handle this is we just replace infinity with the limit. So we're going to replace infinity. I'll use the letter b. So we're going to go lim b approaches infinity integral a to b fx dx. So you just integrate from a to a letter. And then after you integrate, you take a limit. So integral first, limit second. So integrate <coughs> first, and then lim second. There's really nothing more to it than that. There's a second uh, <coughs> integral of type 1, and it's go from negative infinity, and we'll stop at, we'll go stop at a, that works, of f of x dx. So how should we handle this? We're not going to be very creative. We're going to do it pretty much the exact same way. So we're going to let a letter, we'll go with the variable c. So we'll take a limit as c approaches negative infinity, integral c to a fx dx. And again, you do the exact same thing as before. You go integral first, and then limit at the end. And that's all you have to do for type 1. So there's a first form, second form. We could put both of these together. So if you have this form, negative infinity to positive infinity, it would be very tempting to take two limits, let a uh, be the variable that will go to negative infinity, b be the variable going to infinity. But what we actually have to do is pick some value in between negative infinity and positive infinity. So I'll just pick a number c. So we're going to pick some c value. Uh, that's a real number. A lot of times, 0 is really good to pick. Uh, 1, something, a relatively easy number. You don't want to pick like 7,457,732. There's no reason to do something weird like that. So just pick an easy number. 0 is very good. So we'll go integral negative infinity to the number c, fx dx, 
plus integral, start back at c, go to infinity, f of x dx. So you would basically have one of each form. So you choose some number c. A good choice generally is 0. So we'll see in uh, type 2 that we're about to see the other way to integrate infinity. There'll be sometimes the only time 0 would be bad is, or 0 could be bad, it could give you an ugly answer, usually not, but the only time 0 would be an actual bad choice that wouldn't work is if that was a vertical asymptote value. And vertical asymptotes, integrating across a vertical asymptote is type 2. So this is all type 1. You want to go x all the way to infinity or negative infinity, or both. So if you have this third, this third type where you go negative infinity, positive infinity, you just split it up around a number. So go with type 2 now. So we're going to integrate across vertical asymptotes. And sometimes you integrate across multiple vertical asymptotes. So it could be more than one. So let's say that, uh, so suppose f of x has a vertical Is there an E in there? Asymptote. It doesn't matter. Suppose f x is a vertical asymptote at x equals. Let's go with the letter. I want to use A and B. So we'll go with C. That'll work. So we'll suppose x is a vertical asymptote at x equals C. And A and B are in the interval negative infinity, positive infinity. I did something tricky with this interval. This may have been the first time you've seen the closed interval. So what do you think this means? So we know all the real numbers are in there, right? The regular numbers that we're used to using. There's two extra things in here that aren't numbers. They're infinity and negative infinity. So what I'm saying is A and B could be any numbers inside of here, including infinity and negative infinity, which are not numbers, but they could be infinity and negative infinity. We're going to use them as endpoints for our integral. So we're going to go integral A to B, f of x dx. So I know that there is a vertical asymptote at x equals c. I think we also need to make sure that uh, c is between a and b. That will be pretty important. So we got a, we got b. Somewhere in between is our x equals c vertical asymptote. So I do need to also make sure that we have a less than c less than b. So our vertical asymptote needs to fall in between these two. It would be OK if they're one of those is actually equal. So how do we deal with this integral? What we're going to do is go from A to C, integrate, and then go C to B. So we're going to do something really similar. We're just going to split it up into two integrals. So we're going to get some area. So if our function looks something like this right here, what we're going to do is get area 1, area 2, and add them together. And we're going to do that carefully with limits. So we're going to go integral from a to c, fx dx plus integral c to b, fx dx. And the last thing we're going to do is take some limits. 
lim. So we're going to need some dummy variables. We'll go with y. And I'll go Greek. I'll go alpha and beta. So what we need to do, if we think about this picture right here, this vertical asymptote is x equals c. So what I need to do is have a limit approaching c on one side and a limit approaching c on the other side. So our the first area from a to c is going to be a limit as we approach c on the left. The second area is going to have a limit as we approach c from the right side. So you get all your intuition out of this uh, graph right here. So we get integral. Alpha approaches c from a to alpha fx dx plus limit. We'll go with beta approaches c integral. So there's our beta to b. Now I have to be careful about what side we're approaching on. So our first limit was approaching on the left. So we put a minus. So approach to c from, and I like to think of this as from negative land. So from the negative side is how you think of that minus. And then the other one, we're approaching C from positive land. So we put a plus up there. So that's what those two mean, the minus and the plus. And again, you do the integral first, limit second. So that's every single integral, improper integral. You go integral first, limit last. Now when you're doing these, there's a really good chance you get infinity or negative infinity as your area. A really good chance. So we say that if you get infinity or negative infinity, then your function, your uh, integral is divergent. If you get a number, your integral is convergent. So when your integral from a to b, fx dx, if that value is a number, so if this is a uh, number, we say the integral converges. when integral a to b fx dx is plus or minus infinity, uh, we say the integral diverges. So going back a couple of steps, um, when you're saying the integral, why is it from a to c and then c to b? Like so I picked some number, oh I didn't pick a number c, it's our vertical asymptote is C. Th that was the assumption we made. And we want to integrate across a vertical asymptote. Okay. And then in the next step, we have A to um, alpha. And then but where does the beta come in? V, so I used alpha on that side, and I used beta on that side right there. So I just used the variable alpha to approach C from the negative side, and then beta is approaching C from the positive side. I wouldn't want to use x approaches C from the sides because then I would have a limit of x approaches C and an x up here. Yeah. And that would then, then I have an x down here as well. So that would be overusing x.
Another thing, you could put t in, inside your integral instead. The whiteboard doesn't have an undo button. That's very convenient. So we'll do a few examples. There's not that much going on with improper integrals. It just puts together two skills you've been doing for a long time. You've been integrating, and you've been taking limits. The only way I could really make it tricky is integrating across multiple vertical asymptotes. So you'd have to break it up into multiple pieces, or going from negative infinity to positive infinity and throwing in some vertical asymptotes. But in my opinion, that's too much on a uh, final exam or a quiz. So if it's a quiz or final exam question, it would only be maybe one vertical asymptote to infinity, or it would, I would make sure you didn't need to have more than two, break it up into more than two pieces with limits on them. So, you know, I might give you a type three where you have uh, two infinities to worry about, but then no vertical asymptotes. So I'll make sure you don't have to do more than two limits at the end. Uh, the other way to make it tricky is maybe you might need L'Hopital's rule to get your limit at the very end. That's another thing I can do to make it tricky. So you still have to remember how to integrate, and you're going to be messing around with infinity, most likely. So you may have a L'Hopital's rule happening as well. So there's a couple of facts from natural log that I'll write down. Hopefully I'll remember them. Lim ln x as x approaches infinity. So this was a property we got using geometry. <coughs> we used little tiny rectangles that I think were had like a height of 2 to the x, something like that, and we added them up. Or been a while, but we added up all these rectangles and got that the area was infinity. There's another limb x approaches 0 from the positive side, ln of x. That was also infinity. Is that right? That was negative infinity. So that was 2 limits that you may need. There's lots of other limits, but those are two from the natural log that we might need. So let's do some examples. Integral, we'll go one to infinity. So this one, What's the antiderivative of 1 over x? Ln x. Ln x. Let's not do two things at one time. So let's write this with a, rewrite it with a limit and then integrate instead of integrate and rewrite with a limit on the same step. So in order to actually do what I told you to do first, let's not do any calculus yet. So we'll go limit c approaches infinity, integral 1 to c, 1 over x dx. Now we're ready, we can take, we can integrate here. It's not hard to do. So our limit is still around, but we're dealing with our integral. So that's ln x from one to c. So this is ln c minus ln one. What is natural log of one? Zero. So natural log of one is zero. The good news is, as long as it's a number, I don't really care what it is. It could have been 100, it could have been negative 100. <coughs> it's just a number. So it really comes down to what happens with ln of c when c approaches infinity. And this is our property right here that is infinity right there. So we get infinity minus zero, not in an indeterminate form, that is infinity. So we got this integral's infinity, so we say that the integral diverges.
So here's two more example problems. So really similar, at least it looks similar, 1 over x squared. The antiderivative is very different. This is not ln of anything. So this is a very different antiderivative. So go ahead and compute these. I'll do the first easy step. Lim c approaches infinity, integral 1 to c. I'll just write x to the negative 2 dx. That's what you need to do anyways. So go ahead and integrate this. And then, when you know what that, find the antiderivative 1 over 1 plus x squared. You may need your formula page for the second integral. If you, it's a relatively common one. <coughs> it's relatively common, so it's one of the anti inverse trig antiderivatives that you probably use the most. And I picked it because I'm just making these problems up and I want to make sure they're not so bad.
So the last time you may have seen tangent inverse graph was pre-calculus 2. And we probably didn't spend a very long time on it. So you can always take the tangent graph and reflect it across the line y equals x. But you also have to cut up the period, not cut up the period, cut up the domain so that you get a one-to-one -one function. So the original tangent function looks something like this right here. So you basically go and throw away all the pieces that are not right around the period that goes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So you should have gotten convergence on both of these. So the first one converges just to the number one, and the second one converges to pi over two. All right, questions? So that when you got to tangent inverse, that may have been a little more tricky down there. So our last example, <coughs> so we're going to go negative infinity to positive infinity, 1 over x squared. So we got two endpoints to worry about. Good news is there's only one vertical asymptote, so I don't, I'm not going across three vertical asymptotes. So I don't have to slice it up into lots of pieces. So let's really quickly graph the 1 over x squared function so we have some idea what it looks like. Vertical asymptote, x equals 0. We have, it's going to approach y equals 0 on both sides. So there's our function. Do we get y-axis symmetry? Yes, we do. So what does that mean? I can use symmetry and say that area 1 equals area 2. They're the same size. So the total area is a1 plus a2. And in this case, they're equal. So it's just 2 times area 1. So I'll just get area. Actually, let's do area 2. That'll be the positive one. No reason to go with the more difficult one. So we're just going to get 2 times area 2. So we're going to use the uh, symmetry to avoid having both infinities and both sides of the asymptote. So we're going to just go from 0 to infinity. So we're going to get 2 times integral 0 to infinity. And we'll write as x to the negative 2 dx. So any symmetry questions? I haven't dealt with the improperness yet. We're about to deal with that. But I just did the symmetry to avoid having tons of extra limits. So I think I cut our limits down in half. We would have had four limits. Now we only are going to have two. So what I need to do is pick a number between 0 and infinity. So what's a good number between 0 and infinity? There's an infinite number of choices. I like one. One's pretty solid. Two would have been okay as well. Any number you would have said would have been all right, but the easiest is going to be probably one. So we'll just arbitrarily choose one. So we'll go two integral zero to one x negative two dx plus two integral one to infinity x to the negative two dx. So again, I could have chose any number that was positive. So I could have gone with any number bigger than 0. 
So I think we did the one on the right. One to infinity, did we do that? Yeah, one to infinity we got was one. So let's not redo that whole thing. So we'll just say, yeah, it's gonna be two times we did all the work to get one. So what limit do I have to do for this first integral, this first improper part? So use the letter C, or variable C, what should C approach? Which is our endpoint that's giving us trouble? Zero or one? Zero. So zero is where our asymptote is. One's just fine. I have no problem with one. So zero is where I need to worry about. So C is going to approach zero from which side, and we have to be careful. So we can look at our graph. So we're approaching positive side. So we're going from c to 1, x negative 2, dx. So go ahead and antiderivative is the easy part. And then you're going to have to deal with the limit. So what does 1 over c approach when c is really, really small? Did I do a calculus mistake? Yeah. Uh-oh. Is it negative 1 plus? Yeah, it should be negative 1 plus 1 over c. Ah, yes. So I would have gotten the negative of the right answer. So plug in one first, so it should be negative one plus one over C. All right. So what, what does one over C approach when C is super tiny? It's gonna be infinity. Is it positive infinity or negative infinity? Positive. So how do we know it's positive infinity? Because C is a very small positive number. If, C, if we were going on the other side, if C was approaching zero from the negative side, it would have been a really small negative number. So you could write it one over zero plus, so it's positive zero, so that's gonna be positive infinity. That's what you're saying if it was approached from the left, it would be negative infinity. Correct, yeah. If you graph uh, you know, y equals one over C, your graph would look like this right here, and we're going to approach zero from, well, I should point this way. Of course. Yeah, that way. All right. I could distribute this out. Negative two plus the infinity is the important part. Plus two equals, I don't care about those numbers because infinity is hanging out right there. So, yeah, the two's negative two canceled, but even if it was two plus two plus infinity, the infinity is the part that was important. That's the reason it diverged, not the two cancel that two, that doesn't matter. All right, so we got infinity, so we say diverge. Now only one part has to diverge. 
for the whole thing to diverge. So yes, we did get one part that behaved well from one to infinity, but because the other part had an infinite area, the whole thing diverges. So one part diverges means everything diverges. <laughs> So we're about to do the integral test, and we'll do that tomorrow. So we're going to need to know how to integrate cross infinity. Uh, that's the end of chapter 8.